So I'm going to give Davies 25 minutes and hand it over to you, sir. Welcome to the Benchmark Conference. <laughs> Hello, Manchester. So, yeah, I'm Dave Corellin, head of page search at Click and Salt. But today, though, we're not going to be talking about page search specifically. We're instead about data measurement in general. So you've always been, you know, really interested and fascinated by data. But what, you know, fascinates me the most is how little people understand about data and, you know, how to actually gain insights about it. So you know, how do we actually go about getting insights and more of an actionable insights from all the data? So the purpose of today's session is to answer a really simple question which is how best to use all the data available to decide how best to allocate budget across you know, a realm of different channels. So, you know, in order to drive the maximum returns. See, I often get asked by clients, you know, should I put some of my budget towards email? Should I instead put a lot of budget towards SEO? Or even better, put a lot of budget towards PPC? Now, at this kind of stage, I have to resist the edge to just tell them, put it all in PPC. <laughs> and instead use the data you know, available to make an informed decision. So, you know, to actually um, you know, answer this question today, we're going to be looking at attribution from a bit, a bit of a fresh perspective. See, we're going to be answering some of those questions which you know, are often avoided in this field. For example, you know, how do you decide which attribution model actually works best for your business? Um, but before we actually get to that stage, we're going to actually look at the, how the channels actually work in isolated silos first. We need to understand these basic principles before we you know, look at how we interact together. Otherwise, we risk running before we can walk. So, fundamental to first understand, you know, the reasons for pushing and pulling certain channels is first understanding the law of diminishing returns. So, I've got in the dark green there the, um, the graph of diminishing returns, so the one which slants out. Um, budget across the x-axis and revenue across the y. It is going to be a mathematical presentation. Um, and you'll notice that I've got elastic returns there plotted as well. So elastic returns is one that's you know, never really achievable in real life. It's always one which, I mean, how many of you would like to get elastic returns? You just put in more budget and you keep getting the same amount of revenue out. The unfortunate thing there is, you know, if that was the case, we'd all be millionaires. So it always follows this kind of like, um, you know, diminishing returns graph. The more you put in, the, you know, the less kind of revenue you're driving with each incremental bit of extra budget. But the question we want to ask ourselves first is, you know, where is this point of diminishing returns? So we're talking about a curve of diminishing returns here. But inherent in that is, you know, a certain point where, you know, pushing any more and it becomes diminishing, you stop getting as much profit out. So where do we actually stop putting budget in? Where's the, you know, the best budget to allocate? Before we can answer that question, though, we need to decide how do we actually, you know, create our, you know, curve of diminishing returns? So there's a lot of ways of doing this. One way, as you'll see here, is you know, I've taken a lot of different data points. It could be you know, um, different days of a week. So I've pushed and pulled on certain days, tried different budgets. Um, and then from there, I've been able to pop plot a line of best fit, a logarithmic line of best fit. Um, and you, know, you can use a lot of tools to be able to do this. I mean, my favorite is Excel. Um, and you can just nice and easily plot your line of best fit. So to actually you know, answer that question, you know, where's the point of diminishing returns? Let's look at a bit of an example now. So I've chosen two very arbitrary channels, uh, SEO and PPC. Now, as things currently stand in this example, we're spending £1,000 of budget in both channels. Now, SEO is driving £4,000 of revenue. That's coming out of 4 to 1 ROI. PPC, however, and you'll never see this in real life, it's actually not doing as well as SEO. Uh, it's only driving £3,000 of revenue, so a 3 to 1 ROI. Now, let's imagine that um, the target ROI in both cases is 2.5 to 1. So both of these channels are actually performing you know, above expectation. There's an argument to push either one of them. However, you know, SEO is actually doing better in this case. So let's imagine now that the finance director comes up to you and says, you know, I've got an additional 2,000 pounds of budget. For argument's sake, you can only allocate it to one of these two different channels. Now, can I get a show of hands, please, based on you know, SEO is performing better in this example? Bye-bye glasses. Um, you know, who would actually like um, to, you know, you know, pull that budget into SEO as a show of hands? No more. Right, all these people coming off my Christmas list. Um, and then, and now who would like to put it into PPC? Now, PPC not performing as well. 
Surprise, I thought it would be less. Um, but yeah, true friends out there. Now, let's imagine um, that we actually know the diminishing returns gr uh, graphs in both cases. Now, you'll notice that I've plotted the, um, you know, the current, um, you know, current performance, so 1,000 budget for each, uh, 4,000 for SEO, and 3,000 for PPC. Now, PPC, you'll notice, it's a lot of, you know, it's, it's much steeper, the kind of curve. It's, we're further away from that you know, diminishing point, even though we don't know where it is yet we can still quite easily see that um, you know, if we put a bit more in, the graph's a bit steeper, we are likely to get a bit more out of it. Whereas SEO is, you know, it's tunneling off a bit really. It's, um, you know, the slope is not steep. Um, and you can see how we're both plotted there. Now, a chance for everyone to redeem themselves. So what channel now would you rather allocate that additional 2,000 pounds to, knowing that, um, you know, how these diminishing returns graphs work? So who'd like to put into uh, PPC now? Very good. <laughs> okay, so let's dissect this example. And what we want, want to look at here is uh, you know, to understand about incrementals. So what we've actually got here, um, I've plotted what would happen in both cases um, you know, with that additional £2,000 of budget. Um, and for SEO, for that case, we drive an additional £3,000 of additional revenue. For PPC, however, because it's you know, steeper, we're actually getting an additional £5,000. So in this case, definitely better um, to you know, allocate that additional budget to PPC because we now understand about the diminishing returns. Now, if we you know, dissect this a bit further um, in table form, so the red columns there, um, that's you know, the previous uh, data, so the previous budgets, uh, the previous revenue, the previous ROI. Uh, the green is the new budget, so where we currently stand, you know, once we've um, put the extra £2,000 in, in both cases, um, and you'll see you know, the new revenue as a result. But the important one here is the, is the orange columns. Um, for the orange columns, you'll notice that it's you know, an additional £2,000 in both cases. Um, and the incremental revenue we've driven has been you know, better for the PPC, £5,000. And the incremental ROI, however, that's the one to really get your head around. That's the ratio between the incremental revenue and the incremental budget. Now, that's a very important metric in deciding exactly you know, when to stop pushing, when you actually find a point of diminishing returns. You'll notice that for um, PPC in this case, it comes out at 2.5 to 1 ROI, as if I'd made this example exactly to fit with the previous target ROI. <laughs> So, you know, how do we actually go about finding that, you know, point of diminishing returns then? So, and maybe the two advertisers have, you know, exactly the same, you know, revenue per cost graph, but each business's individual point will be based on, you know, respective business margins, different lifetime values. So it's all about looking at the gradients and the incrementals, you know, to decide, you know, where does that incremental ROI become break even? And if we put, start putting any more in, the incremental ROI becomes unprofitable for us. That's the point of diminishing returns where we hit that incremental ROI and any additional budget we add becomes you know, past break even. So we need to find that out. Um, <coughs> so ways to go about this. Anyone who's particularly good at calculus um, you know, will be able to take that curve's equation, differentiate, solve for the cost of resulting equations differential equaling the break even incremental ROI. And this always surprises me though. You know, not everyone loves calculus, I <laughs> know. So there's a, there's a second method, and this second method starts by transforming our revenue per uh, budget graph into a profit per budget graph. Um, and you can see just from an illustrative point of view there, it's you know, very easy to see um, exactly where the you know, incremental, or so the break-even point is, the diminishing point of returns. It's the, you know, the maximum point because the profit, once the profit starts going, um, that means that you know, you're not driving anything additional. It's, it's going down in terms of returns. So, you know, to actually, you know, determine this, you have to look at um, adding the customer lifetime values and margins, taking into account the budget itself of a profit. Um, but as I say, it's very easy then to, to see it from an illustrative point of view. However, we still, you know, need to find that, um, at, you know, that actual budget that results in the maximum profit. Now, again, we can turn to our good old friend calculus. Now, what we do here is we differentiate this curve instead. Uh, and we solve for the stationary point which is where the differential is equal to zero. Make sure you differentiate again, of course, so ensure it's actually a maximum point. I mean, it's obvious. Um, and then after that, you just solve the resultant budget. No one fancy that method? <laughs> okay, don't know what's wrong with you all. We'll Luckily, there's actually a way to you know, do this without using calculus. Horrible, I know, but it's a fantastic little tool known, known as Solver. Now, Solver is built into all new versions of Excel. It's like a, a free add-on within it. 
And what Solver enables you to do is to dynamically look across all the different budgets on that curve, and it enables you to find out what the maximum profit is on there. So by, it looks across every single option, and it dynamically finds out which one is you know, results in the maximum profit. No maths needed. So I'll show you an example and make it a bit more obvious. So this just runs. OK, so we've got three channels here, A, B, and C. And we want to maximize the total profit there. Now, each one has you know, a current budget and a different profit based on you know, an equation there, you know, the profit per cost graph. So what we do is we go to data and then solver on the right-hand side. Now, we set what we want our objective to be, which is the maximum profit, the total profit. And we want to maximize this. So we just set it to maximum by changing the variable cells of all those three different budgets across each different channel. As quick as you like, you just press solve, and it's dynamically found the maximum profit in every single case. So it's found out the, you know, the perfect allocation. Let's imagine though you've only got 16,000 pounds to play with. We've got 19,000 pounds of budget there. You can set a constraint in solver as well. So what you do is go add constraint, and then the cell reference is the total budget and we say that that has to equal 16,000. Click solve again. And then that's dynamically found, you know, the best allocation across all these three different channels, subject to the constraint that, you know, it has to be 16,000 pounds of total spend. So it's done the job for you there, no calculus needed. So, you know, this works, um, you know, perfectly well you know, looking at how this all works, if, um, you know, we can see the channels just working together or just working in isolation. However, it's not the case. Channels work together to create, you know, an end-to-end -end customer journey. So pushing one in favor of another, it might lead to cutting off, you know, the source of assisting conversions, you know, if our measurements focus solely upon last click results. So this is where the attribution comes in. So looking at how channels, you know, work together, it's a realm of cross-channel attribution. Um, now, when most people think of attribution, we think of, you know, the first thing we think of is these popular kind of models. So can anyone name the, the top one there for me, please? Yeah, last click. Second one? Yeah. Uh, the third one down? Linear. Linear, thank you. And the last one? Well done. <laughs> That's why I have you right in the front. <laughs> Okay, you're also able to you know, create your own ones. These are ones that are freely available within Google Analytics as kind of like default. Um, but what you can also do is create your own type of one, which is you know, focused towards both first click, first click and last click. It's so like a kind of parabola model. You know, it um, kind of like tends down towards the bottom. Uh, these ones you know, aren't available in Google Analytics, but you can still you know, create them and model them yourself. Um, you know, the next kind of thing that most people tend to think of when we think of attribution is all focused around engagement metrics. So again, within Google Analytics, and it's fairly recent how that, you know, when this uh, came about, is we're able to um, you know, set certain channels to be upweighted dynamically based on uh, you know, the certain engagement metrics, such as time on page, uh, how many pages viewed, the type of page viewed, you know, um, a blog versus a product page. So you can still upweight those you know, directly within Google Analytics. So that's you know, what most people think of when we think of attribution. <coughs> But to bring you back, though, you know, I promised a, a fresh look on attribution. And you'll notice that this positional uh, method and also you know, the engagement-based methods, we all kind of focus around paths to conversion. Now everyone's become very ingrained in this idea that you know, the best way to you know, measure results is all based on these paths to conversion. See, the kind of issue with this, though, is it only gives you, you know, an idea of you know, how things are currently doing. It's fundamentally flawed, really. So. Let's, use, let's have a look at a bit of an example. Let's say that we've got some very scarce and diluted data. So we've got, say, hundreds of referral domains. Imagine we go on for as, lo as long as you like. Um, and you know, we've only got up to about 60 sessions uh, per month. Now, the conversion rate is you know, very low for this business. It's, um, you know, we get, we've had one assisted conversion across there. <coughs> Now, it may be the case that you know, with this data being so diluted, it may be the case that you know, there's actually some hidden gems within there, but we can't really find out. I mean, it's channel nine there that's uh, you know, got the assisted conversion, but that might be just a bit of a fluke. It might be that you know, one of the other channels you know, or referral domains is actually performing very well. We just don't know because the conversion paths are in such short supply. So you know, how do we find this out? Now, to use a football analogy, if you've got a team full of misfiring strikers, 
Um, <laughs> And you need a way of discerning which of your midfielders, you know, your assisters, are actually putting in a good shift, even when those end goals just aren't coming in. So the best way to look at you know, players like these, you know, the, the midfielders, the assisters, when there's no goals, uh, is to look at you know, stats such as their pass completion rate, you know, to decide how effective these actually are. I mean, to what extent can you really blame a midfielder who makes you know, a fantastic pass for a striker, only for him to consistently uh, shoot wide, mention no names of those? Um, so yeah, so rather than looking solely at conversion paths, you know, it makes sense to look at other attribution metrics, you know, other than just paths to conversion. So what we quite like to define is you know, an equivalent for a pass completion rate in our cross-channel attribution. Now this will become a lot more clear for this example, hopefully. So let's imagine that we start off with one interaction, PPC, and then it doesn't necessarily lead to a conversion. We're not talking about conversions at this stage. It just leads to another interaction from SEO. It's made a pass to SEO, if you like. So then SEO leads to another interaction from social. So at this stage, everything's had 100% you know, pass completion rate. It's not thinking about conversions yet, but still moves to display. Display then moves to SEO. And then SEO does a good job and moves it to, e uh, to email. So we've you know, resulted in you know, further interactions. We've done a good job there. We've had people engaged. Now, email, however, not to pick on one channel in particular, but um, for whatever reason, this example, it loses the interest of a, uh, of a user. They're no longer engaged. Um, you know, perhaps you had a poor user experience when we hit the channel, but either way, that was the last channel, um, you know, the last interaction that this person actually had. It's led to a drop. That customer or that potential customer has gone forever. So in this case, we'd say that everything except for email has had a 100% pass completion rate, but email, however, has had you know, a drop there. So I mean, this is, it's the same as like, uh, you know, looking at, say there was a game that ended nil-nil, a football game ended nil-nil, you'd still expect you know, the manager to still be able to say, you know, which uh, team members actually put in a good shift. You'd still be able to you know, figure it out even if there's no conversions there. You've got to look at other metrics. Okay. So if we kind of layer this back again, we layer this back with um, you know, the previous referral domain um, data, and we can actually see now we've got passes and pass completion rates. Now it's much easier to see you know, which of these channels are actually the best assisters because we're looking at a different metric completely now. It's a completely fresh look on it. Okay. Now the importance of you know, why this all kind of works as well is because it ensures everything fits in nicely to the awareness, consideration, conversion funnel. Now you've got to remember that you know, even though we're looking at data, it's actual people behind this data always who you know, follow this basic funnel towards an end conversion. So an awareness stage, it might be someone who's you know, based on the engagement metrics. It's someone who's perhaps you know, looking at About Us pages. Uh, you know, they just find out a bit about your brand. That's how they're first kind of interacting with you. Whereas the consideration kind of um, phase is when people are looking at perhaps product reviews, going through lots of different products, deciding which one we like, maybe you know, a, a few basket pages in there. Um, so we defined before you know, a pass as being something quite beneficial, you know, something that just leads to another interaction. Now, if we've got passes between awareness, so you know, it's one interaction leading to other interactions, um, you know, just people looking at the blogs, the About Us pages, then it's not too beneficial, really. I mean, it's not driving people further down the funnel. <coughs> but you know, to use a football analogy again, so I think will be the last one, sorry. Um, but it's you know, the equivalent of you know, just defenders passing to each other all day if you've just got awareness passing to awareness. I mean, if you want to see defenders pass to each other all day, just go to Old Trafford. But instead, <laughs> but instead, you know, anything that makes a pass from awareness to uh, consideration, you know, the equivalent of a defender passing to up to midfield, that's you know an aggressive move. It's moving further towards the end goal. So they're the ones which you'd actually want to upweight a bit further as a result of that. So there, you're also important ones like you know an even better pass if you like. Now. The pass completion rate looks at days when you know, conversion um, data is in particularly you know, short supply, very scarce dilutive data sets. However, you know, there's lots of other attribution analysis out there. And I'll just go through one other one quickly, which is with versus without analysis. Now this is the complete opposite, really. It's when you've got quite a lot of statistically significant data. It's uh, you know, all aggregated together. Now let's imagine a very, very simple um, you know, path to conversion here. We've got PPC to SEO. Now that's resulting in a 2% conversion rate, and we know that to you know, st uh, statistically significant amount. 
Now let's consider instead you know, this other um, path to conversion, you know, very similar, but it begins with social. So it goes social, PPC, and then SEO. Now this path to, conver to conversion results in a 3% conversion rate. So the only thing that's different between these two conversion paths is the presence of, of a social channel. So the social channel has actually resulted in an extra one percentage point of you know, conversion rate there. So that's one that you can again uplift. You can look at you know, very, very similar channels and use with versus without analysis to find out more. So I want to bring this all together now. So bring back these kind of three channels. They're the exact same three channels we looked at previously in the solver example. <coughs> And what you kind of see here with these is, you know, we've drawn out the profit per budget graphs. And we kind of saw this when we, you know, dynamically solve them earlier. Um, so all with different profits, uh, maximum profits, and all with different budgets, which result in those maximum profits. But this is how we work together in silos. You've got to remember, we're not looking at the attribution just yet. Now, if we look um, how, you know, we actually maximize based on last click channel profit, like we did in the previous solver example, all we were kind of looking at before were these three initial columns. Um, so what we've kind of got here is, uh, you know, we've maximized it out with all these different budgets, a total of 19,000, and that resulted in 27,000 pounds of last click channel profit. Um, now that's, you know, all well and good. That's just based on, uh, you know, those channels in isolation. However, as we all know, there's a bit of attribution as well. So attribution kind of happened in the previous exam. We didn't look at it before, but it's a kind of a bit of a bonus. We, um, we got some attributes of profit there from each of the channels, resulting in the total profit. Total profit is just uh, this one plus this one, the third plus the fourth column. So it's a bit of a bonus, but you know, we got that attribute of profit. We knew nothing about how to calculate it. It just kind of happened, and we're happy that it happened. Uh, so, you know, maximizing each silo individually, as we did before, it led to 45,900 of total profit when we maximized for that 27,000 pounds, because that was all we could maximize for before. Now, I'm just going to bring back the exact same table as uh, I just had up there. Um, but now, we actually know some attribution rules, say. Now, these attribution rules could be based on, you know, the past completion rate analysis, with versus without analysis, or any other, um, you know, attribution analysis you want to undertake. Very, very simple rules, I know, um, and it's likely to be much more complicated, you know, in real life. But, you know, if you can understand the basic principles, then you can apply it to real life situations. So you'll see that for channel A, when we actually spend, uh, you know, one pound of additional budget, it leads to additional profit for both channels B and C. That's the attribution at pl play there. Um, and the same for both of the other two channels as well. We result in additional profit for the other two channels. You'll notice that channel B is actually, you know, the one which is particularly a big assister. It's resulting in a lot of additional profit for the other two channels. Now, let's have a look at a different table now, because what we've actually been able to do, now that we know the attributed profit, we understand how to calculate this column here, and hence this column as well. So rather than just being, you know, this bit being smoke and mirrors to us and us only being able to maximize the last click channel profit, we've actually been able to maximize the total profit, your bottom line at the end of the day. So, you know, you'll actually see that, that you know, we've driven more total profit now that we know about it. And actually we've, um, we've brought in, you know, less last click channel profit because we've known we're best to allocate and it's not being to allocate, you know, just based on individual silos. So we've actually, um, you know, put more budget, you'll notice, into channel B because we know it's a bit of an assister. So based on, you know, maximizing on these attribution rules, we've actually resulted in an additional £1,334 profit. So that's, you know, that's amazing, really. It's, it's data measurement which is actually impacting the bottom line because often people get, you know, so swamped up with the data that we forget that it's, it should be always about maximizing the bottom lines. It should be actionable. Okay, I mean, the important thing to, you know, remember here as well is you need to go back and you need to actually test these actual uplifts. Make sure we, uh, you know, we meet your expectations ba based on these rules that you found out. You know, go back then, look deeper into the data and refine more where necessary. I mean, you're never going to find like a, a holy grail of attribution. There's always going to be some insights you've not yet uncovered or, you know, data that can't be 100% measured accurately, you know, like offline attribution. But if you dig out each of these insights one by one and apply them on top of your channel's uh, you know, cost per profit curves, then you can start making incremental improvements to your bottom line. So just to recap quickly, the first thing you need to do is to uh, find out your profit per cost graphs for each of those channels in isolation. So basically don't run before you can walk. Look at how they all work before attribution. 
Then look it up where you think, you know, the high engagement channels alongside, you know, the first click, last click, whatever model you want to choose there, um, those attribution models. So that's the kind of, you know, the basics of attribution. But then when data's in, you know, really short supply, look at other metrics such as, you know, a pass completion rate. And that's a good way of doing it when, you know, the conversion data is in, is in very short supply. Finally, you know, um, you know, well, in addition to that, then you want to actually, you know, upweight further any passes which, are, you know, passes that move people further towards conversion. If someone's um, being moved towards, you know, um, from an awareness to a consideration phase, then you want to upweight that even further than, you know, a standard pass. You want to use with versus without analysis when the data is particularly, you know, significantly large. And then what you want to do is you want to combine. You know, number one, what you found out there with points two through five, which are your attribution, and combine that all in Excel. Then what you're able to do is maximize the total profit, not the last click channel profit, but your total profit, your total bottom line that you know, takes into account all those attribution rules you've dug out, and you can do this with Solver, no maths included. And then the last two points are just make sure you, know, you regularly review these budget allocations, make sure they actually do meet your bottom line, and you know, finally, um, you know, keep, um, keep digging, find more attribution rules as you go, you know, add more in, make sure the ones you've already got there are working as you'd want them to. So overall, you know, I hope this has given you a taste of, you know, the different ways we need to re-examine the attribution question and giving you some understanding on how to actually put into practice, you know, maximizing your overall returns. And we should never forget that's what measurement's always about. If it's not, you know, putting into practice maximizing your overall returns, in, in my opinion, it's quite useless. So thank you all so much for listening and I'd really love to hear any questions you might have.